One of the things that interested me is something that uh, D Detective David Dickinson said, and I have criminal defense lawyer Karen MacArthur right here in studio, and thank you for letting me pick your brain and understand not only the process, but um, the ramifications of this uh, plea. I thought, okay, you plead guilty, everything's over, the investigation is over. And then David Dickinson comes to the microphone there and uh, talks with reporters and says the investigation is not over. We're hearing they could be looking at former cold, uh, cold cases and others who ha perhaps have been reported as missing. Does that surprise you? It doesn't surprise me, and it's the right thing to do in the, in the search for justice and the search for truth. We, we know that for the better part of a decade, the police didn't connect all the dots here for the eight missing men and so given that is the case given that bruce macarthur is now an admitted serial killer it is absolutely the right thing to do to keep digging uh, with the shovel as it were with through the dirt reaching out to other jurisdictions and exploring cold cases and perhaps uh, finding other uh, victims of bruce macarthur Today, the fact that Bruce MacArthur pled guilty to those eight counts, he stood up in court and he said guilty, guilty eight times. What does that um, save, uh, and you've been in this position, I suppose, where clients have pleaded guilty. What does that save not only the community, but the court and the public, if you will? It saves a very prolonged trial. This one would have gone at least uh, four to five months. It uh, spares everyone the possibility uh, that a judge determined that one or more of the eight counts he was only responsible for second degree murder or manslaughter because he did it in an episodic rage or in a drug induced state um, or, uh, or it wasn't planned and deliberate. So this is an absolutely surefire thing and it brings closure right here and now. It doesn't bring closure in terms of the pain to the heart and the trauma uh, that the, the victim's families are going through, the Toronto community, and the detectives, the Crowns, and the defense lawyers. Everybody that's been up close and personal with the facts of this case is forever changed, traumatized. We're going to hear some of that trauma in those victim impact statements, which are set, by the way, for Monday, February 4th. That is before the sentencing hearing. What can... What, uh, impact uh, does that statement have when it comes to a judge deciding sentencing? And what is the purpose of it? There, there is very limited uh, scope for Justice McMahon to do anything other than send this man away for the rest of his natural life. Look, if he's eligible for parole at the age of 92, it's only he's eligible mm -hmm. for parole. Then a parole hearing has to be held if uh, he only receives um, a concurrent sentence on all eight counts as opposed to consecutive. Mm -hmm. So really, Justice McMahon doesn't have a choice here. Bruce MacArthur will, in all likelihood, die in prison. Probably sooner rather than later because he won't fit in very well in prison given the horrors of his crimes. What the victim impact system statements do is it allows for participatory uh, democratic uh, sentencing, as it were, so that many voices can uh, fill the hallowed halls of justice and people can feel that they have a stake in our justice system. Because after all, the justice system is a tool that we human beings have devised to allow us collectively to determine truth and separate it from fiction, mm -hmm. but also to allow us to understand Bruce A and Bruce B, to understand and that's the how evil of side of human nature and to allow us somehow to come to closure, if it's at all possible. And it's across a broad spectrum. Some people will be able to forgive and forget and move on, and some people notwithstanding participating in the victim statement will become ever more bitter but at least it is a forum in which victims families who have been affected by this can have a voice within our justice system is there a chance of an appeal when someone pleads guilty stands up in court and says i knowingly uh, plead guilty i voluntarily pass on a trial is there any wiggle room in there very very limited scope for wiggle room, I would first of all, Judge McMahon did the entire inquiry with Bruce MacArthur, mm -hmm. um, which he did on the record, and then he admitted uh, responsibility for each of the eight uh, counts of first degree murder. A snippet of the statement of facts was read into court this morning. No doubt the defense counsel on behalf of Mr. MacArthur said, Yes, Your Honor, those facts as they're read in are correct. And then 
normally. Bruce MacArthur is asked as well, and he will nod or say yes. And this will continue through on Monday. I, you quite often will also see that the accused signs the agreed statement of facts. So I that's an additional hold on you. I, I do want to ask you about this agreed statement of yes. facts. It was read into uh, the records. A bit of it today. Uh, a bit of it. Uh, and, and it's horrific. Um, we were hearing, and I should give our viewers a warning, that some of the descriptions in that agreed statement of facts you uh, may find disturbing. But as I understand it, Karen, it includes the fact that the Crown summary says Bruce MacArthur took photos of his victims, that in his apartment police found a bag containing a syringe and duct tape and other items which he used, they say, to confine his victims. We do know that all of those were sex-related crimes. We do know, and this is information that you've read in the months gone by, that the uh, bodies of the victims were dismembered, some of them found in planters in a home in Midtown Toronto. Other. Um, parts of uh, one of the victims found in a ravine nearby. We also know that Bruce MacArthur kept some mementos, jewelry and notebooks. What happens to that agreed statement of facts and, and who has access to it? It becomes part of the public record. It, will, it was read in today. A court reporter transcribes it and it is publicly available. Our court system is premised on it being open part of the democracy aspect to it um, and that will continue through on uh, Monday. It may well be that photos or uh, notebooks, if there was anything private written in by a mm -hmm. deceased, a victim, are subject to privacy concerns and are shelved off so that the media can't have access to those. But in the normal course, open. All right. Uh, I just want to correct something. I think I may have said all of them were sex-related crimes, as I believe it's six of those eight fall into that category. Karen, I want to thank you very much. You've allowed us not only a perspective of what's going on in the courtroom, but also the emotion of this story, because you cannot separate the murder of eight people in one community of a city from what is felt in the heart. It is a story of incredible emotion, and you've helped us to understand the process and the emotion. So thank you very much. Criminal defense lawyer Karen MacArthur are here in studio. You're very welcome.